Dana Allen is the uh, Synod executive for uh, really a relatively new denomination, uh, Eco Presbyterian Churches, Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterian Churches. It's about seven years old. Uh, it got started when seven of the larger church pastors in uh, PCUSA decided that they needed to pull out of PCUSA, and the primary reason was over the issue of biblical authority. And so they couched that decision in terms of biblical authority as opposed to uh, other items that they might have talked about. And at this point, seven years down the road, there are over 400 uh, churches, including church plants, that are now part of this denomination. Uh, I've been working with ECO now for close to three years, and uh, one of the things that impresses me about ECO, as opposed to some other denominations that have pulled out of mainline uh, groups, is their real commitment to say that their purpose as a denomination is to develop flourishing churches, which would be translated in their terms as churches that are focusing on the Great Commission and making that a priority. And so uh, as one of the Dana's uh, comments all the time is uh, we're not here to change denominational jerseys, but we are here to do the Great Commission. And so uh, I've appreciated my time with Dana. I've been impressed with his leadership, what he has done. Um, it's interesting that his uh, doctoral work was in the uh, transformation of medium and larger congregations. Um, obviously, he works with a lot of smaller congregations in the denomination, but interacts with the larger congregation and really being the synod executive functions as a large church pastor. So that's why I've asked him to talk about leadership and what he's seen in terms of churches and leadership because he's all across the country and around the world. In fact, uh, some of the things that uh, God is helping ECO do in the Middle East is really Really, really interesting. So, uh, Dana, I'm delighted that you're here today, and uh, we're going to ask you to just to begin. Uh, after Stan, would you lead in a word of prayer, and then you can begin. And Roy, if you're really the only one that's going to be on live with us, uh, feel free at any time to stop, ask questions. But he, uh, Dana is going to have a question period at the end uh, of the time. So, Stan, if you want to lead in prayer, and then Dana, if you'll just kick it off. Great. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to uh, meet over this medium, especially as we uh, all desire to see the fulfillment of the Great Commission in the local church. And so, God, we just ask that you would use this time, uh, even for those who are not with us, but we'll look at it later down uh, over video. We just ask, God, that uh, you'd use this time uh, to build your church, to advance the gospel, and for that we'll be thankful. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for that introduction. And it's been fun to work with uh, with you, Paul, on uh, church transformation. When when we started ECO, uh, a lot of times churches who or denominations who will start because of theological splits will simply just try to, to um, protect their theology. And what we said in starting ECO is we said there's really two problems that we're trying to address. One is the theological problem problems. And so we can solidify those with essential tenets and, and reinstituting biblical standards, those types of things. Uh, but we said we, we also have to, to change um, really what it means to be denomination and how we do church and what's the best way to create environments for churches to grow. And so, uh, as Paul said, part of the reason I got started is when I was doing my research for my doctorate of ministry, we were focusing on the revitalization of medium and large, uh, at that point, Presbyterian churches, and just saying, what are the particular challenges that come up for those churches when they revitalize versus a smaller church that knows, hey, we're either going to revitalize or, or die. Uh, so that was fun, fun to do and to create an environment. We have a lot of large churches in our denomination, uh, partially in, in due large part because a, large, a lot of large churches helped to start Ego. Uh, and in watching them and in watching churches of other denominations, I wanted to pull out today, I think, you know, from a bird's eye view, what are the 10 things that I see effective large churches doing well? And I like when Paul has worked with us on church sizes, you know, he's talked about smaller churches are like apples and churches over 200 are like oranges and churches over a thousand are like, you know, larger oranges. And so some of the things that Paul has helped our medium and smaller churches begin to implement 
are the things that I think have to be really uh, solid in larger churches. And they, they have to be clearly present. So I'll just pull up these, uh, these particular things for us. Um, the first thing that I see is that they have real uh, crystal clarity on these five irreducible questions of leadership. Uh, so a lot of different authors sometimes will say four irreducible questions of leadership, some will say five, some will say three, but it's basically the what, why, how, and where it is that our churches are going. And I like, you know, when we've been working with our smaller churches, we just give them their mission and we give them their vision and we make it real simple. We don't want them to spend a lot of time really working on, uh, you know, sometimes churches can spend a year working on vision and mission and they don't actually accomplish or do anything. And so we don't want that to be the case for our small churches. However, when our churches get a little larger and when they have more of a particular impact within an area, uh, and they have more complexity in terms of ministry and staff, what I see from the real larger churches is that they're asking, they're, they have clarity on these questions, the, the what, what is our mission, what it is that we do, that it needs to be clear and it needs to be specific to their church. So a lot, a lot of times I'll say for our, you know, highly Presbyterian, highly reformed churches, I'll say, if we can take your mission or your values or whatever, and we can just plop it onto the Assemblies of God Church down the road, um, then it's not unique enough to your church. Uh, so we, we help them get clarity on what their mission is, what their values, again, what makes us distinct from the other churches. Um, when are we uh, successful? And so what are the measures that we need to articulate of, of what we want our people to, um, to become? So a lot of times I'll talk with churches and say, okay, you have a, a new person coming into your church, Mary, and Mary's involved in your church for five years. What do you hope happens to her after five years? And a lot of times you get blank stares and someone will say, well, I hope she's on a committee or, or something, you know, something like that. And I say, well, let's have a little bit higher of hopes for what we actually hope Mary becomes. Um, and then they have crystal clear uh, clarity on the how, that the, our strategy is simple and effective pr to produce our measure. So our, is our strategy, uh, whether it is you know, small groups, whether it's people in missional communities, whatever it may be, are we really clear on the strategy for how Mary or Joe or whoever uh, becomes the person that we want them to become? And then they also have clarity on, on the vision, on the where, um, that it's specific and that it's vivid enough to both um, inform decisions and also inspire actions. Because what we see with a lot of larger churches is that it isn't that they ha don't have enough going on. That sometimes can be the challenge of small churches, but in the large churches, they may have too much going on. And so um, we want to have clarity in our vision that can really help us determine what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. So clarity on those questions are, are key and crucial for us. Uh, our churches. Oops, I may have clicked this too much. Um, second is that they, they ruthlessly measure what is most important. Uh, um, a lot of times churches will, you know, measure the, the nickels and noses and, and the butts and bucks, those types of things. And obviously those are important things to, um, to be able to measure and to look at. Uh, but they also want to begin to look at what are the really important metrics that we want to measure in our church. So for example, uh, on the individual level, that we want to measure individuals engagement with non-believers. So we may want to, you know, seen it in our, in churches where they will say um, on a quarterly basis or on an annual basis that they'll say, you know, how many significant relationships do you have with non-believers that you are leveraging for, for the gospel? And that's a metric. You know, if people say none, then, then even if they're giving 10% and even if they're showing up every week, um, they may not be fulfilling that metric. And so we want to start pe moving people in that direction. Uh, they may want to measure, do you have a spiritual growth plan? Uh, so again, rather than just, are you attending, do you have an area where God is forming you to be able to work? Um, and then, you know, they may have other characteristics related to their knowledge or, 
you know, uh, fruit of the spirit, those type of things. Uh, and then across the church, they measure things like um, conversions. So in our church, we always wanted to make sure that at least um, half of our new members were people who were formerly unchurched. And the way that we define that is if they hadn't been significantly involved in church in at least the last five years, then that was, you know, because we're Presbyterians and the baptism thing gets a little um, confusing for us, or sometimes it's, it's not as helpful of a metric for us, but we want to measure conversions. So if people say, yeah, I grew up in a church, um, I was, you know, maybe baptized as a baby, but once they actually join join the church, if they have not been involved in the church for five or 10 years, we would call that a win. Um, they, they measure guest retention. So of our first time guests, you know, how many people are staying, how many people are uh, moving toward, you know, becoming members or, or whatever that language we, we use. We want to be able to measure that pipeline and that flow. And then they want to measure the engagement in the strategy. You know, how many of our people are involved in the strategy that we're trying to, to lay out for, for the people. So they're, they're ruthless about those kind of measurements. And I would say a lot of times, um, even many of our large churches don't do this. And when they begin to do this, when they begin to do some of these, these measurements in their churches, uh, kind of what gets measured gets done. And so then people begin to actually uh, live according to these new measurements. I like what Paul says, we, we measure what's important. And if uh, I remember Paul saying, you know, if he had to take five kids to Disneyland, he'd be constant, constantly counting them to make sure that he didn't lose any of them uh, on the way, because that's what would, what would be important. So we want to measure uh, what's vitally important. The third thing um, is they have more focused ministry efforts. So this goes back to the idea of, uh, is our ministry producing what we want it to produce? Or are we just running our men's ministry because we've always run it? Uh, and instead of just adding more and more programs, we may want to reduce and do some of those things with, with greater excellence and make sure that they're actually producing the kind of disciples that we want to to produce. So we say medium churches tend to have lots of programs and ministries, uh, and they want to serve that as a buffet for people. But what, what I begin to see in effective larger churches is that whole concept that, that Eric Geiger talks about in Simple Church is that actually, you know, less is more. And so effective large churches will begin to cut down the number of uh, ministries that they have, but make sure that they're in line with the strategy and they're actually producing what they want to produce in terms of the measures. Uh, okay, four. They, they move from ministry generalists. Oh, Larry, are you trying to ask a question? No, no, just joining the meeting, and my apologies for being late. Okay, you know, that's, that's fine. I thought I, your thing started to light up, so I thought maybe we're trying to ask a question there. Um, so they begin to move from more ministry generalists to more ministry specialists. Um, I, I forget if it was Leith Anderson that I first heard this from, but I've seen it multiple times where they'll say half of the staff that got you here won't be able to get you there. Meaning if we were able to, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so I'm just going to let you until we do the question and answer time. Okay. Uh, you know, meaning that if you move from 400 to 1,000, half of the staff that were able to help you get to that move aren't going to be able to get you above the 1,600 or, or 2,000 kind of metric. Uh, so we begin to start having, instead of generalists, people that are, you know, we have one or two associate pastors that do a little bit of teaching, a little bit of pastoral care, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We want to move to real specialists in ministry. Uh, that are recruited because, you know, they do have their focus in student ministry or children's ministry, and they really are professionals in that. And what begins to then happen is that staff will not come from within. A lot of times in medium churches, you will have, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, well, this person is a great children's ministry volunteer, and they have, you know, a little more time in their hands, and so we have a half-time children's ministry position open. Let's go ahead and make that person our children's ministry, you know, pastor or director. 
that usually works in medium churches, harder to do in larger churches because you really need those professionals in that area. Now, if you happen to have that from within, great. Uh, but, but usually it will be some more outside recruiting that's necessary. And then the senior pastor then focuses more in as a uh, specialist as well on focused on teaching and vision casting primarily. Uh, and then at, you know, at kind of the 1000 to 2000, they may be also deeply involved in leadership development, usually above 2000 to 3000. I see that move more towards just primarily, you know, teaching vision casting, uh, those types of things. Okay, then number five, um, <clears throat> elder governance moves toward a Carver, you know, what we call policy model. Um, and this is where I, I see a lot of challenges with our churches because as Presbyterians, that comes from the word elder and being elder governed. And what we think that means is that elders are micromanaging the, the ministry and they're actually making a lot of decisions that really they shouldn't be be making that should be up to the senior pastor and and their staff to be able to do rather than spending a lot of time uh, of elders you know really trying to micromanage really trying to get into the weeds on strategy the staff are are the professionals and so they should be the ones to really execute the vision make decisions about hiring firing those type of things and so what we would say is that the elders especially in our churches need to probably do these five things. They need to ensure um, fiduciary responsibility. So they are the, you know, they are the legal entity of the church ordinarily. Uh, and so they want to make sure, you know, we have appropriate insurance, we're, we have um, background checks for those working with children. We have offering counting policies that, you know, those are the things that can get you in trouble. And so elders need to make sure that's in place. Um, then they want to set high level goals and and general boundaries. So, I, you know, I use the analogy of a, you know, of, of a football player. I'm, I'm in Southern California. And uh, so we have, a, I'm a USC fan, although I don't admit that this year because uh, they didn't even make it into any sort of bowl game. But, um, but the, the question is, I mean, Clay Helton is the coach of USC. Now, the athletic director, those people do not micromanage the, the calls that Clay Helton um, makes and they don't, you know, the Clay Helton's responsible for recruiting and the whole managing the team. But when that doesn't go well, like when I went to the USC Notre Dame game, there's a plane flying that says, that asks the uh, athletic director, please fire Clay Helton uh, because, you know, because they just weren't, weren't performing. And so I think that's, that's actually a good analogy for how our, our churches are to work, that, that our, our governing body, you know, really has the high level goals, the general boundaries, you know, here's the things that, um, you know, that, that you can do. They set those things and they really let the pastor be able to, to run with it with their staff. And then they move into kind of blocking for the pastor. Uh, really, you know, when people don't like the changes that are being made or whatever happens that the elders are really stepping forth and and giving authority to the pastor to be able to do that then they hold the the pastor accountable and then the fifth thing they might do is they might serve as an advisory group to the pastor on strategic matters so a pastor may say hey we're thinking about changing our our worship times or we're thinking about adding a fourth service or we're thinking about this uh, the elders may not need to approve those types of things that ordinarily would be, you know, pastoral and staff type of decisions. Uh, but the elder, the pastor may want to get the elders input on those things. Are there things that we are, are not taking into account? But that's real clear of when we want to know that our board is serving as actual decision making body versus advisory body. And to be real clear with them uh, and have really clearly laid out Right now you're making decisions, right now you're serving as uh, advisor. And then the pastor's head of staff leads the church, committees go away, uh, and the staff recruit teams to execute the ministry. So that's one, one of the other huge problems that, that we see is in the area of committees is that all of you know, the, the committees have people making all kinds of different decisions, and then it's really a challenge. Okay, well, who is, for example, the mission pastors 
supervisor? Is it the missions committee? Is it the senior pastor? Is it the elders? Instead of saying no, the, the missions pastor runs the missions of the church, and the committee is really a team of people that, uh, that they gather together to help implement that uh, and execute that, that ministry. Uh, the sixth thing um, is the comprehensive uh, um, attention to the guest adoption process. Um, I've really started to use this word guest adoption rather than, than assimilation. Because normally in assimilation, we're trying to assimilate people to say, oh, yeah, you can come to our church as long as you are like us and, and we assimilate you into our culture. And I think biblically, the, the term is more uh, conducive of a family, a body. Uh, Chap Clark, who is pastor at St. Andrew's uh, Presbyterian and has written a lot of books, uh, recently had a new book come out called Adoptive Church. And he really talks about that aspect of, of we want to adopt people into our family. And, and even large churches want to have a little bit of that, that, uh, that mentality. Uh, <clears throat> so we want clear attention to that process. So uh, in weekend worship, um, guests should never be lost. I, I was talking to one guy who has a, of all of the first time guests that they have, they end up having a 50% retention rate of those first time guests becoming members of their church. And, and I said, man, I've never heard of that. I've heard of once you get to third time guests, maybe 50%. And he just says, we're just ruthless about, we, we capture who people are, um, you know, in worship, we capture them in children's ministry. And then they have worship hosts who are responsible for about five or six kind of pews um, in, in an area or, or rows of, of, of chairs, that those worship hosts are acting as anybody who is sitting in that area. They are guests in their house, and they're going to make sure that they know everybody and they get, you know, a first name, even if nobody writes anything down. Then after church, they go, oh, yeah, well, I talked to Bert, and he was he was sitting up there, and he's – uh, an engineer with this new company, even if they didn't have kids, they're beginning to get that information. And so they just write down his name, Bert, and, and, but they're just very intentional about gathering as much information as they can appropriately and being able to, to follow up well uh, in, in the next phase and the worship host is to then to greet them next week, etc. Once they have the information they need, you know, then obviously they're doing appropriate follow up in terms of uh, letters or um, gifts, whatever those things might might need to be. Um, I, I do like when we're talking with our churches, we will oftentimes say that for a small church to grow, they need to increase in the quality. So usually that's the problem with a small church is just the, the quality of, you know, of worship or special music or preaching, all those kind of stuff. Usually that's lacking, but they have very high community because they're a family oriented church. Uh, but for a large church to grow, they need to increase the community feel. Uh, now, that doesn't mean, you know, we're taking prayer requests on Sunday morning with everybody kind of, you know, shouting those out, that kind of stuff. But we're increasing the connectional ability that people have with each other. Uh, okay, number seven, um, staff moves from doers of ministry to equippers of ministry. So this is uh, this goes hand in hand with staff moving from uh, generalists to to specialists. But a lot of times we hire people because they we want them to be the doers of ministry. But especially in large churches, that the success for those staff members aren't how much they do for ministry, but how much they equip others for ministry. And obviously that can be a real hard. Um, you know, when when you were talking there about uh, moving some of the caregiving and being proactive. You know, a lot of times, oh, I want the pastor to visit me and it only counts if the, if the pastor actually comes. And so there's a change in social expectation that happens in the church that, um, that instead of we are paying the people to do ministry on our behalf, instead, no, you're paying them to be your personal trainer to help train you to be able to fulfill the ministry that God has called you to whether that's small group leader, whether that's, uh, you know, Stephen ministry, caregiving, uh, we have to, to move into that and help the six, help make metrics for our staff, not being the doers of the ministry, but the equippers for ministry. So, um, you know, if I'm hiring a pastor for care, I want them to be caring, but more important, I want them to be able to train other caregivers. 
Uh, so we then ask the question, well, what are the goals that we have for the staff? And are they related to, uh, to, to equipping people for ministry or doing ministry? Um, okay, number eight, um, when um, appropriate, they plan for succession. And I think this is, you know, one of the big challenges. We have one of our largest churches that's going to have a, a, I think, a, a huge challenge ahead of them because the complexity of, of that church. And we're trying to get the pastor to begin to think about, um, about succession and proactively plan. And it's really hard for pastors to do that uh, because they're worried that they're going to be a lame duck. They're worried... Um, you know, they're going to be kind of put out to pasture. And so we, we try to help people say, no, what you're doing in this time of succession, if you're five years, if you're three to five years away from, uh, from retirement, then you want to be helping your church to plan for the next season. And so Will Heath, who we have worked with, um, I think has some of the best information about succession planning. And what he did is he commissioned Barna to research hundreds of pastoral, um, that should say successions, uh, hundreds of pastoral successions or transitions to determine what were the key factors of success and what were the factors that contributed to failure. And he pulled out these key principles in success regardless if it was an interim, uh, an internal successor or external successor, regardless if it was an overlap or um, a start and go or an intentional interim, really figured out what are those key principles that need to take place to move forward. So what we say is we say it's more than passing the baton. That's a lot of times what churches think is that, oh, I'm just passing the baton from this pastor to this pastor. But instead, what it is, is it's also preparing the congregational environment for a new person to come in. So if you have a tree that is planted and it has, you know, deep roots and that tree, you know, is removed or falls over or whatever, if you're going to plant a new tree in that place, you're going to need to do some things for that environment to make sure that that new tree has what it needs to succeed. And that's going to be a little bit different than what the older tree needed because it was already established. And so we talk a lot about preparing that environment, whether that's getting clear on, you know, mission, vision, those type of things, getting your, getting the church's governance in order, um, handling difficult staff issues, helping the church really to diagnose what are the environmental factors that um, will potentially derail the next pastor that need to get fixed now with the, uh, with the long-term pastor who is there. Uh, the ninth thing is they're preparing to birth, and you know we we say and and Paul said a lot with us, and I 100% concur that healthy things grow and multiply, uh, and so that if we are a healthy church, um, we are going to be growing, and at some point we're going to be ready for for multiplication. You know my my daughter is now a 10, and so if she is healthy, she is growing, but she's not yet at the point of multiplying. And we do not want her to be at the point of multiplying for, you know, a good 10, 15, well, probably 15 years. I don't want her to be 20. Uh, you know, there's, there's a time and a place for that. But eventually God has made it into our DNA that healthy things grow and they eventually multiply. And larger churches are at that point that there's probably enough health where they can really multiply well. So they're hopefully identifying church planters. Um, potential team. Hopefully they're identifying new locations or situations uh, that, you know, maybe they're reaching a particular type of group in their community. Uh, and now they need to switch a little bit to, um, uh, to, you know, a, a, the millennials or to a different uh, racial ethnic demographic, whatever it might be. They're investing financially and personally in the next plant, uh, plant and they're just they're strategically determining how multiplication should occur, you know. Meaning, we're thinking strategically about it. Um, are we trying to rebirth our church in a new location that's going to have the same same DM, DNA, or are we saying no? There's a new type of church that's re needed to reach a new type of person, and we're just being very strategic about about that uh, about that process. So they're they're preparing to birth. And then the, the final thing here is that they use um, strategic outsiders. I think a lot of times churches, especially 
um, especially medium and small churches, ironically, will think, oh, we don't, you know, we don't need outside help. We can do it on our own. And what I find interesting is that the churches who are the healthiest are the ones who know that they need outside help at the right time. And so they need those strategic outsiders who will, who will come in and who will help them do um, certain things in a certain season. And so I have seen large churches being able to bring in a strategic outsider to help facilitate processes you know, that answer those five questions of leadership that, um, that, that even one of the best people I know that answers those five questions of leadership, and we use him to consult with a lot of our churches, when it was time for his church to develop their clarity on their mission, vision, values, that kind of stuff, he brought in a strategic outsider who probably wasn't as good as him, but he knew he needed an outside person to be able to facilitate that process if it was really going to, you know, to take, to take root and, and flourish. So they're answering those five questions of leadership. Maybe the strategic outsider helps in the succession planning or, you know, or the hiring to when they get search firms, uh, maybe evaluating ministry. They want to learn how to develop ministry. Hey, we've never done church planting before. We bring in a strategic outsider that's going to help us to do that. Um, or maybe that there's some, some conflict resolution that needs to take place that somebody strategically from the outside does. And so it's, it's, remarkable to me how much I see that relationship between the most effective people are the ones who are most effectively bringing in strategic outsiders probably more often um, than, than not. Uh, so that's kind of a, you know, a little high overview of those things. Here's the, um, the summary of those there if you wanted to, to remember what those, what those were. And uh, we can take time to dig into any one of these uh, to a greater extent or you want clarity and I'll, I'll unmute uh, Larry here um, to see whoever wants to double click on any of these. Okay, Dana, thank you first of all for doing this. Uh, Stan, I would like to ask uh, if you could make sure that we get the PowerPoint as a separate uh, entity because there's a lot of good material on here go back to I, I would appreciate it uh, yeah. I want to ask one question and myself and then I'm going to leave it open to who else would but before I do that I want to remind you that uh, the reason why USC has better football players than UCLA is that it's easier to spell yes <laughs> okay uh, you just went through uh, going back to your first slide where you talked about the clarity of you know vision and values etc you just did that as a as a denomination with Oxano Dana yes. what was that experience for you you're six years at that time when you start into the process uh, what were there major changes was it more refinement what was the best part of that experience for you I think for us um, because it was particularly challenging as a denomination to say that um, what does it mean for us as a as a denomination to have a vision when fundamentally the mission of our denomination is the flourishing of our local churches. So we don't want the vision to be about us. We want it to be about the flourishing of local churches. So that was a very, it was helpful for us to be able to say, okay, what are the things that we, you know, what are those metrics? What does it mean to be a flourishing church? And so it was helpful for us because a lot of people say, oh yeah, we love that mission uh, to build flourishing churches. But then they get, um, they get overwhelmed by, okay, well, what does it mean to flourish? So we would say a flourishing church knows its unique identity and calling, um, normalizes this is risk taking, nurtures missional living, expects disciple making, generates multiplying leaders, and prepares to launch. So, and we have metrics along all side of it. So it's it's been very helpful to give us clarity and to say what are we doing and what is our leverage point. We finally said our vision is that in ten years we want to see a thousand flourishing churches. Um, and according to the metrics, so it's still all about the local church. And we said in order to do that. We have to train and we have to recruit, train, and retrain a thousand vocational leaders and ten thousand lay leaders. So that's really our metric as a denomination. 
And it's been very helpful to say, that's our leverage point, that's our key point, and that's what we're focusing on. And when we do that, uh, then churches will flourish. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. so, so I have a question. Um, but first I'd like to say the University of Utah swept both the Southern California schools. So, uh, <laughs> um, and the question um, relates back to what you said about the staffing and half the staff won't be there. And, you know, back when I was new here, we took a trip to Leith Anderson's church and in his very blunt way, he looked at the group in the room and he said, half the people here won't be here five years from now. And he was right. Mm. Um, but how in the ECO do you go about evaluating that? What's the best way to do that? I know there's the gut component. Um, how much do you ride your gut? How much of that is more objective? And then the second part of that question, how do you as a senior pastor know whether that relates to you? <laughs> mm. um, because not every senior pastor, you know, can take it from a certain level to the next level. Yeah, that's, I, I, yeah, great, great questions. And I think, um, you know, I'm a little bit more of the mindset, especially if someone did get us there. You know, if someone did move us from 200 to 400, but they're not the right person to go 400 and above, usually those, usually those people um, kind of know it and they, they're, they're uncomfortable with it and they don't want to, um, they're afraid to admit it a little bit, but once they get permission to have the conversation, um, then I, I have seen more often than not people kind of invite themselves off the team. Um, they, we, we say, thank you so much for getting us here. You know, here's what we're going to need in the next season of ministry. Um, you do a fantastic job. Um, one of the challenges is recruiting new leaders and that doesn't seem to be your, your strong suit. I don't want to put that, I, I want to either help you be able to do that well, or if you don't feel like you can do that well, then let's go ahead and, um, you know, let's go ahead and move, move toward the future and help give them that point. And usually good people will realize, yeah, they have enough self-awareness that even if they try for six months or something like that, that it's frustrating to them, they're burnt out and, and they leave. Um, when, when it comes to a pastor, we use a couple of different tools. Uh, one is a pro scan that is it's probably one of these tools that you've we use them for actually a lot of a lot of these staff as well i think it's the best tool you've never heard of um you know a lot of people use strengths finders and disc and i like those because they focus on you know your general strengths but what the pro scan does is it begins to look at where you're feeling pressured to function differently than you currently are so every time i've i've had the point where i knew this person wasn't going to make it I have showed them their pro scan. That's all their own data. And to say, this shows a high level of energy drain. This shows a very low satisfaction. You know, tell me how you resonate with that. And they will respond and they're, they're usually thankful that, that they have had the opportunity to do that. And because it's been their own data, they've invited themselves, you know, off the team. So we'll use that for them. And then we'll sometimes also use it for the senior pastor. For the senior pastor, we tend to use, and we're starting to use it more and more, um, the leadership circle tool, which is a good 360 evaluation, I think is the best 360 evaluation out there. Um, and that's also, I think, a good time to bring in a strategic outsider, probably every two or three years to do that with your with your senior team, you know, uh, you know, four or five pastors, whatever it is, and to do that. And with that coach, they can help bring um, either say what holes need to be filled or uh, in, you know, in your leadership, or maybe this thing's grown past your capacity to lead it. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? You I said that you're uh Try, your, your goal is to train 10,000 lay leaders. Are, what tools or what, what's the strategy there? Is there any way that can be shared? Um, mm -hmm. your, how, how's that going to be fulfilled? Yeah, well, we have, we have a couple of different resources that we use with churches. And if a church, the, the way we would count it is 
um, if those churches are going through it. So if we're doing the church transformation cohort, you know, with Paul, I would say those elders are, you know, they're in that retraining process. So obviously you can't t train 10,000 people really, really, you know, right. deeply. But if we can retrain elders and we can retrain, you know, volunteer staff that, you know, that we've done through that church transformation cohort with Paul, if we can expand that out, that'll make a great, a great bit of difference. We also have um, a resource that we use called Flourishing Leaders, which is, you know, how do we help our leaders um, flourish both in their individual calling, but also to function well as a team. That takes some of the principles in the church transformation cohort and, and, makes it a little bit more widely applicable. Um, and then we have a commission lay pastor um, program that's, uh, that's, that's working with an individual and helping them go through. We have 10 leadership competencies that we want for our, you know, for our elders, for deacons, for pastors, for commission lay pastors. And so um, people will be going, are going through that, that as well. Dana, you talked about one of the metrics uh, early on was um, me uh, measuring the number of uh, non-Christians that people in the congregation are engaged with in some kind of meaningful way, I'm assuming, toward the Great Commission. It's not they just work with them, but they're doing that. How have you seen that done well? Yeah, that and, and that that is a hard one. I think the best way to get that done um, – to the most accurate way is in some sort of small group type type format um, where a, you know, if you have 50 small groups in your church and you have those people who are leading those small groups that they're, they're doing that with, you're training those people on how to evaluate their group. And so there's ways, you know, you can do it with a questionnaire and that's helpful. But um, ultimately, if we can think, hey, how many, how many times have you shared, have you presented the gospel uh, in the last, you know, six months or, or the last, you know, three months, those kind of things can begin to, to, um, to be the, the measures that people have. And so small groups usually is the best way to get, gather true data. I like also doing it with the whole congregation and having them partially because what gets measured gets done. So even if they had no gospel presentations in this last year, if, um, if we're asking them that, then, then they're going to start realizing that that's a need that they actually need to be doing that. And they're going to be more receptive to doing it and getting trained to do it. Okay. I know you wrote a book on missional communities. Does that in part fit in with what you're trying to see happen in your small groups? Yeah. Yeah. And we have, we also have a, um, a discipleship ex assessment that kind of, that asks, it doesn't ask, you know, how many gospel conversations have I had, but it does ask, you know, do I have people in my life uh, for whom I am regularly uh, sharing the gospel? And so we, you know, we've done a validation process of that and you can kind of help look it out and just say, oh, most churches their people have a low score in that particular area that, that we would qualify that as the characteristic of engagement with non-believers. So we have, we have um, a 360 tool that helps to, to do that as well. Okay. Thank you. And I have another question. You talked about multiplication and it sounded like you were talking about actual church plants. Can you just comment on the whole, online phenomenon and uh, just using technology as opposed to a physical, you know, church in a particular location? Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know if there's enough research that has been done to, to really evaluate those, that success, or I'm not aware of it yet. I have talked with some of the people like at Exponential, because I've said, obviously, we see this coming and you know and what are you what are you hearing what are you seeing as as the effectiveness of that I think the concern are you familiar have you seen John Christ you know who he is mm -hmm. okay so he did he you know does his little parody videos and he did something that I thought was uh, I don't know if you saw it the guy he gets out of bed and he goes to a virtual reality church did you see that Yep. Yeah. And he puts on virtual reality and you get to choose what you want your pastor to wear, how intense you want the sermon to be. 
um, those kind of things. And it's, you know, and I was watching that one and I said, wow, we're, we're really close to that in terms of I can listen to whoever I want to listen to online and I can choose, do I want this? Do I want that? Um, so I, I, I don't want to be one of these older people, you know, who like, oh, technology, blah, blah, blah. but I am concerned that it is actually breeding consumerism um, rather than true, authentic gospel community. By the way, Stan, that reminds me, uh, uh, Wynn Langford, uh, of, all the church, of all the group who are part of this whole process, they probably have done one of the best jobs that I know of in dealing with online. It may be interesting to have him deal, take a session and deal with that and how they are working through as a congregation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let me let me say this as well. Just on the positive note, we have um, we're deeply invested uh, with uh, the the underground church in the Middle East, and you know some of their connection is truly. I mean, if it wasn't for the online piece, these Christians would be totally on their own. And I would say they are developing very deep, accountable relationships across a virtual platform. So I think it's, you know, is it targeted for convenience? Then that would be my concern. But if it's really facilitating discipleship growth, then then I think it can work. And and Dana, just, you know, to give you a little background on my question there, you know, in Utah, there's hundreds of small communities where there's an LDS presence, a Mormon presence, nothing else. And even if you wanted to plant a church there, you couldn't support it financially. They can mm -hmm. And so we're exploring, you know, some of those technological ways to bring the gospel to those communities where we could never plant a church even, you know, if we wanted to. So I'm just looking for some good intel mm -hmm. on, on who's making that work well. Well, and, and I think if you if you're going from that perspective and you're wanting to get it into and, you know, maybe we have some of those places as well. And that's where we'd have a commission lay pastor who's really, you know, doing some things and they're getting, um, you know, maybe some online teaching, you know, from from that. But they're they're also developing authentic relationships, you know, with one another. I, I think I think then that that can be very. Yeah, that could be a great way to go about it. Yeah, ho hopefully you see the difference between, yeah, that's a tool to facilitate versus convenience. Yeah, I do. And and our hope is that there would be small communities, almost micro sites that are maybe meeting in living rooms, but then they also meet later during that same week as a small group. So it's mm -hmm. you know not just looking at a screen, but it's hopefully forming a community eventually. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's great. I think that's why it's so critical that any church of any size intentionalizes um, a sense of community because you know you can go to a large church and not and, and be there every single Sunday and never have any sense of community mm -hmm. and um, and you can go to a small church and and still not have any sense of community so in our culture today it seems to be the thing that we're losing most intensely is a sense of community at any level mm -hmm. and so I, I think that's where you have to figure out some way to intentionalize community. I'll, I'll be very interested to pick, is, is your book uh, on missional communities? Can we purchase it? Uh, yeah, you can purchase it through, yeah, through We, we Sell It. It's called Together on Mission. And it, it is, um, it's, it's really a study guide. It's to help. There, there's a lot of good books out there that help form missional communities in, um, if that's the already existing culture of the church. Um, what is harder is to take like the established small group type people and begin to put them on mission together. And so this is a 24 kind of week study to begin. How do we integrate gospel community and mission together uh, to, to be able to reform ourselves, reform the community around, around the Great Commission. Okay. The name of the book again? The name of the book? Together on Mission. Larry, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thank you, Dana, for, for all this. Um, you were talking about the adoptive church earlier, and uh, I'm curious what else you've seen in terms of large churches creating community. You'd mentioned guest hosts and sections. Uh, what else have you seen that's really good at growing community in a large church? 
Yeah, it's, you know, um, and part of the reason people obviously go to large, large churches is sometimes to be anonymous. You know, I've heard, I've heard people will say, yeah, I'm going there because I can slip in and slip out. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes, all, obviously, small groups, um, you know, missional communities, I think if you get together for a purpose, it's a lot more powerful than getting together just for the sake of getting together. Um, so we, you know, we have had different mission, uh, mission opportunities at my last church. We had a separate not-for-profit that we would have our, our community group together. And even people who weren't in a small group would kind of get connected with another small group and would go serve there and they would begin to form relationships and, uh, and, and those, those types of things. Obviously, you know, being able to find those right people who can really welcome um, but also link people to each other. So I like the, you know, the I'm sure Paul or somebody's talked about it before that Lego analogy of, of we only have a certain amount of pegs on our, on our Lego block. And if you're extrovert, you have more pegs, if you're convert, you have less, but most, most real sociable people already have all their pegs filled. And so if there's ways that you can, you can have, um, you know, once a month or once a quarter, bringing people together to be able to have, you know, a meal with the pastor, but then also begin to form relationships with each other and then want, you know, potentially launch those kind of things into small groups, et cetera. Great. Thanks. By the way, Penn State fan here, uh, just still <laughs> upset about the last Rose Bowl with USC. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the only reason why uh, you hey, told it so well, it's all that special underwear they <laughs> wear. <that much. laughs> so. Hey, whatever it takes, man. <laughs> hey, Dana, That's I want to thank you game. for uh, taking the time to do this. And the information I found very, very helpful. And uh, I appreciate that. Thanks for what you're doing and uh, for how you're leading the denomination. And thank you for taking time to do this with us. We appreciate it very much. Great. Well, thank you all.